Again, welcome. If you're just joining us, welcome to the Fervent Church Online. We don't normally do this, but we got a snow day outside, um, literally about four or five inches of snow out there on the ground. So we had to make some changes, but we're grateful that we can be here. But we're going to be in 2 Chronicles chapter 20 tonight. Um, and also, if you are just joining, um, I asked everybody else, if you could help expand our reach, share this on your Facebook page, hit the little share button, um, maybe caption it, say, hey, join us for church tonight. Um, and let's just see how many people we can reach so that uh, people may know Jesus. Because that's what we're about here. All right. So anyways, our message title tonight is not the most uh, encouraging one. It's not the most exciting one. But this is what I've been feeling and thinking about all week. And so here's my message title. Um, and uh, don't write it in the chat because it's just depressing. But here it is. The Divided State of America. The Divided State of America. Now, if you've been alive um, on social media, out in the world, reading or watching the news, right, you are well aware of the problems, some of them at least, going on in America. All right, I don't think that's too far-fetched. Um, just to clue you in, if you don't watch that stuff, on Wednesday, this past Wednesday, January 6, 2021, right, there was a, a gathering of the Senate, and they were going to verify the election results for the President of the United States, all right? And so there's a lot of things going on, a lot of debate, a lot of things to be discussed. And amidst that same time, right, again, if you're watching the news and you know the story a little bit, there was a protest being held, right? Um, there's many people, probably close, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of people there um, gathered in Washington, D.C. to protest this thing. And, and they're peacefully protesting for the most part, okay? And I'm not asking for opinions on this, so don't get crazy with me. But there's a lot of peaceful protesters. But there was a small group, from what we can tell, who went in and they broke into the Capitol building where the Senate was meeting to um, verify the election results. They broke in. One woman was shot and killed in this whole act. Um, many other people were harmed. Different things happened. A lot of stuff happened, all right? And I'm not here to try and um, condemn any one person or group. I'm not trying to justify anything or anyone. But here's my thought. I'm thinking about this all week, and we're supposed to be in Mark chapter 3 right now, by the way, but I just felt like I don't know. I just felt compelled where I'm like, no, we got to dig deeper and we got to address some of the issues that are at hand. And here's one of the issues in my heart on the matter. And I'm sure many of you would agree, like between Republicans and Democrats, the left and the right. Like my honest opinion is just, man, I hate it all. I hate it. Right. I think I feel like just a bunch of kids bickering about little things that don't matter. And they make them into big things. Right. It's like, well, he tweeted this. He said that they did this. They didn't do that. All these different things. Right. And it's just it's a bunch of nonsense. But here's what's happening, guys. If you haven't noticed right now, like in our day and age, all of these cultural events, and I'm not trying to say they're not important, don't care about them, but they are sucking us in, sucking our attention away from the things that matter most. And, and that being Jesus Christ. God Almighty, His Bible, His Scripture, right? Meeting together as a church, unifying together. See, what is happening is Satan is crafty. Satan is clever. And he's using all of these different things that we've seen over this last year and some change to distract us. But even more than that, he's using it to divide us. He's using it to divide us. Jesus said that a house divided or a kingdom divided cannot stand, right? Right? And so if you want the house to fall, if you want the kingdom to fall, stir up division within it. And that's what we see right now in America, but even more so, like, we see it in the church. There's division happening in the church. There's division happening in the world. And so my thoughts, like, just on the things that happened this week, it's just like, man, like, this is, it's crazy. It's crazy, if you ask me. I've seen Christians um, condemning other Christians, uh, on Facebook, uh, Instagram, on the news, on the radio shows that I've been listening to, like Christians condemning other Christians. Like, should that even be? No, it shouldn't, obviously, right? And from both sides, too. So let's not get all heated and, and well, they are wrong, right? It's like, well, I've heard it from both points of view. I've heard, like, the left uh, people um, condemning the right, like a Christian on the left condemning a Christian on the right, a Christian on the right condemning Christians on the left. And it's just this divided, messed up situation that we see. And I'm just sick of it. I'm sick of it. I'm sick of seeing all the hate speech, all the condemning speech. And it's just bad. And maybe is this me? I don't know. Hopefully this isn't hate speech. <laughs> I'm, I'm ironically hating on the thing that I hate, I guess. 
Um, but it, man, it's sad. Um, and I think many, much of the world will look at us, different nations, different countries, they would look at America and they long to come here. But then they look at us arguing and bickering and fighting over each other, breaking each other down, uh, destroying our country, essentially. And all, and this is my thought is like, at one point, and we are today somewhat, we were the United States of America. But now what I see more than ever is we are the divided states of America. We are in a divided state for sure. Now, here's my question as we dive into scripture tonight is, uh, is in light of what is happening right now. All right. And you have to understand this, that you and I are seeing and witnessing history take place. But understand this, that you and I are in the midst of this history. In the book of Esther, it says um, that you were born for such a time as this. Right? You're born for such a time as this. And so now we got to think about this from a biblical perspective. All of this craziness going on, all the challenges that we've been faced with in the last year COVID 19, uh, race um, things going on, right? Riots, protesting. Um, I mean, you name it presidential election, all this stuff around that. It's like all of this craziness, we've been placed in this time. You and I, Christian. Okay, and so understand this, God has placed us here, and if we know from Scripture that He places us into uh, places and times for such a time as this, you and I need to understand this, that God has put us here for this moment. All right, that should be very encouraging. That should be reassuring, give you some confidence where it's like, I felt weighed down, like I can't do this, Lord. I don't know what I'm doing here. The world's a mess and we just want to bail, right? But we need to understand that God has put us here not to go bail and, and jump ship and say, no, I'm out of here. No, he's put us here to be a light in the darkness. And now all of a sudden we're seeing the darkness. So what does that mean for you and I? It's time to shine. Can you write that in the chat for me? It's time to shine. Let's go, guys, Christians, brothers, sisters. It's time to shine. We can't be sitting on our on our butt all day long and hoping that the world gets better and that people come to Jesus, yet we aren't going out to take Jesus to the people. Okay, so here's my question for you tonight, starting out anyways. With all that's going on in the world, what are you doing about it? What are you doing about it? What are you, do, what are you doing about it? See, you may think to yourself, well, well, there's nothing I can do, Nick, right? It's the president. It's the president-elect. It's the vice president. It's the vice president-elect. It's the governor's fault. It's the mayor's fault. It's this people group fault. It's that political party's group fault. Uh, political party's fault. Right? We think, oh, well, I don't have any, any, any influence. But again, God has put us here for such a time as this. And so we have a position. And so here's my encouragement to you, my picking up from last week's study and it's the same message again, but I want to tell you, Christian, in this day and age, it's time to take your position. Take your position, right? Last week I titled it, It's About to Go Down. Well, man, after this past week, it's like, it's going down, guys. It's going down. We're living in it right now. And so we got we to gotta get it together. And we need to take our position because um, we... We're seeing, we're witnessing the divided states of America, but we're going to see and witness the divided state of the world to where, I mean, Scripture tells us, man, it's it's going to go down. The world is going down. It's going to go into, I don't got time to get into it, but read it. Revelation, uh, Daniel, um, all those things of prophecy to happen in the end times. But here we go. Second um, Chronicles chapter 20, verse 1. We're going to kind of skim through this whole chapter, pull out some nuggets that I really want to focus on, and I think that we need to understand um, as we try to take our position as Christians in this world, okay? Um, 2 Chronicles 20, verse 1, it says this, After this, and so we need to pause there because many of you weren't here last week for our study, but it says, After this, and so what, what happened? That means, well, what happened before this, okay? Well, what happened before this? Jehoshaphat went to battle. Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went to battle with King Ahab. He didn't battle King Ahab. They actually paired up and they went to battle together. But King Ahab died. Um, but Jehoshaphat saw the Lord come through for him and he succeeded. He came out. Um, everything was good. After he came back, he started putting into place all these reforms, um, building things. He got a lot of people to start serving the Lord, praising the Lord, and understanding that, hey, guys, we're here for the Lord. Um, it was a, a, a great time, a time of success, a time of, um, I don't know what you want to call it, a time of favor where they just saw um, a good 
upward trajectory, if you will. All right, so it says after this, though, after all this success, it says the Moabites, the Ammonites, and with them some of the Menunites, so that's three uh, people groups, three armies, came against Jehoshaphat for battle. So we talked about this a little bit last week, but it's like, hey guys, understand this. Like after every success or after you made it through a season, it does not mean that it's over. Like, oh, we made it through a battle. Oh, we made it through 2020 and now it's 2021 and we can just kick our feet up and relax and chill. No, not at all. After every battle is another battle. Until Jesus comes back, we're going to be battling things, right? Satan hates what we're doing. Satan hates whose team we're on. So he's going to bring battles our way. And so Jehoshaphat sees this success, but then sees a battle. Verse 2 says, Some men came and told Jehoshaphat, A great multitude is coming against you. So in other words, like success is happening. Then these guys come and they say, Hey, Jehoshaphat, some dudes are coming to make war. Like they're coming. Bad news, right? And so, jump down to verse 3, it says, Then Jehoshaphat was afraid, and set his face to seek the Lord, and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And I want to pause there for a second. Look at that. Then Jehoshaphat, after hearing what these men said, now there's this war, there's this battle coming for you, it says he was afraid. Now let me ask you a question here tonight, um, viewers, Christians, maybe non-Christians, is like, over this last week, over this last year even, has it provoked something in you, like this sense of fear, where it's like, man, I don't know what's going to happen, right? You see this stuff going on at the Capitol building this last week, and you start to see the response of people, man, it's like, I don't know what's going to happen. And it makes us makes me a little bit, a little afraid, where I'm like, I don't know, God, this could go really bad, really quick. And I don't know if I want to, I don't know, it just, it sparks this fear in, in me. But here's the thing, as many people, and maybe you, when we're afraid, we get into this protective mode, right? Defense mode, one of our defense mechanisms, like I'm afraid, so now I'm going to snap back. I, I don't know the answer, so now I'm just going to throw some things out there. And man, haven't we seen over the last week so many hurtful, terrible words that the Bible says that your tongue can either bring life or death. It's in the power of your tongue, in the power of your words. And over this last week, I'd say we've seen a lot of people speaking death over people. Maybe not straight out, flat, plain English, but the, in the, the tone, the things that they mean, it's not good. And so my question to you is like seeing these things. Yeah, we're afraid. We don't know what's going to happen with coronavirus, right? We don't know if the vaccine's going to work or whatever. We don't know what's going to happen with uh, the transition of presidents. We don't know. We just don't know. And that might spark some type of fear in you, and that's okay. And that's okay if you're afraid, if you're, you just don't know. But here's the thing that's not okay is to just start lashing out on people because you're afraid. Because you're afraid that, that the, the right might take too much power. Because you're afraid that the left might take too much power. We start to lash out and say things that we shouldn't, right? No, in other uh, what we should do in our response is what Jehoshaphat does. He was afraid. And he set his face to seek the Lord. He started praying. He started seeking the Lord. So guys, you and I, like when we are afraid, when we don't know what's happening, we don't know what's next, and we're at God, we need your help. We got to come before God praying, setting ourselves to seek the Lord. And that's, that's if we want to take points tonight, that's point number one. Take your position. And number one, a position of prayer. If you want to take your position in God's army, you want to be effective in building his kingdom. Well, I think number one, especially from this text, is take your position, a position of prayer. And then he goes on and says, and he proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. Proclaims his fast throughout his whole country. And then check it out. Verse 4 says, and Judah assembled to seek help from the Lord. From all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. So he proclaims this fast, right, to the whole country. And then they all respond. How crazy is that? Right? And, and, and in an instant, not an instance is not the right word, but similarly, like I want to proclaim to you a fast in this day and age where we're like, hey, what are we doing? Like there's a bunch of bad stuff going on. We can talk about it all day. It's fun to talk about some of the stuff and hear the theories and the conspiracy theories of what might be happening and taking place. But at the end of the day, it's like if we're not praying and fasting and seeking God, what are we doing? We're just we're just 
putting ourselves into the ways of the world, being like the world. In a Christian, honestly, we have no place there. There is no place for us in the world. And so we see he proclaims this fast, this prayer, the seeking of God. They all respond, verse 5, And Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem. So now he's like in the assembly, like the people have come together. And now he's there speaking to them in the house of the Lord before the court. And he says this prayer. And I just want you to take note. It's just like an incredibly honest prayer, a humble prayer. Um, but I, say, I would say a powerful prayer. And it says, verse 6, and he said, O Lord, God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? You rule over all the nations, all the kingdoms of the nations. In your hand are power and might so that none is able to withstand you. Did you not, our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever the descendants of Abraham, your friend? So what he's doing, Jehoshaphat's coming before the Lord in the midst of the people and he's saying, God, Aren't you God in heaven? Like, I'm, I'm in this place where all these people are coming, and they're coming to attack us, try to take over our country, try to kill us. And so he's afraid, rightfully so. But then he comes before the Lord in front of the people, and he, he goes to the Lord and says, Oh, Lord God, aren't you God of heaven? Right? And I think that's a great prayer. Like if you and I, we feel afraid, we don't know what to do next. Like come to the Lord, God, aren't you God of heaven? Like obviously the answer is yes. Yes. And it's okay to ask God questions like that because we're not really asking him the question. We're just, we're, we're putting it out there and we're letting ourselves know. We're reminding ourselves that yes, he is God in heaven. And then the second thing he goes on after saying that, like aren't you God in heaven? Then in verse 7 he says, did you not do these things? He remembers of what God had already previously done. That's a value of us at the fervent church, and I hope it would be a value in your life to remember. It's not just something fancy we say. It's something like we want to remember what God has done. We want to remember what he's done in Scripture. We want to remember what he's done in our life, because when we remember what God does, has done, it will fuel us and encourage us and point us and give us hope for what God can do. Amen? Amen? So he's, didn't you do all these things, reminding himself, reminding God of these things? And if you jump down to verse 12, it says, Oh, our God, will you not execute judgment on them? For we are powerless against this great horde that is coming against us. In other words, he's like, God, if you don't come through, we're going to die. We're going to be taken over. And we're not going to make it. In that last sentence there in verse 12, he says, We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Where are your eyes at today, Christian? Or non-Christian, if you're tuning in with us. Where are your eyes? I know for me, I watch the news a lot, and I, I try to stay up to date with current events. And it's very tempting to get sucked into that, where my eyes are on what's happening in the world. And I think it's good to be tuned into what's happening in the world, but man, our eyes need to be on God. Where we understand and we sense and feel what's going on in the world, but we're like, God, because of this, my eyes, I'm going to pivot. I'm going to turn. I'm going to position myself in a place of prayer. I'm going to seek you, God. My eyes are on you, Lord. It's okay to not know what to do, but you got to have your eyes on God. Verse 13 says, Meanwhile, all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, and their children. So everybody's gathered here. You know, it's in just the leaders. You know, it says, every, All of Judah, little ones, kids, wives, children. Verse 14 it says, And the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, son of Benaniah, son of Jeel, son of Mataniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, in the midst of the assembly. So essentially, uh, a prophet rises up. The Spirit of the Lord uh, comes upon this guy. He rises up in verse 15. It says, And he said, Listen, listen, all Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat. Thus says the Lord to you. And anytime someone's like, hey, thus says the Lord to you, man, you should probably listen up. Give an ear to him. Um, it says, listen up. Thus says the Lord to you. Do not be afraid and do not be dismayed at this great horde, for the battle is not yours but God's. 
And this is part of why I wanted to get back into the scripture again, right? To, to dig deeper. Because, man, this battle we see that, that seems to be unfolding in front of our eyes in America, right? The, the constant division, the riots, the protests, the hateful speech, different stuff going on. Man, uh, it's easy to think like, like we got to come in and we got to be the savior of this whole thing. But if we're on God's side, we're in God's arm, uh, army, we're children of God, we got to understand this battle isn't ours. It's God's. The, the pressure isn't on us so much as we might think it is, like to save the world. No, we got to show up. We got to come to battle. We, we take our positions, but the battle, it's God's. It's God's. And so verse 16, he says, tomorrow, go down against them. In other words, he says, like, go to the battle. Go, show up. He says, Behold, they will come up by the ascent of Ziz. You will find them at the end of the valley, east of the wilderness of Jeruel. You will not need to fight in this battle. But he says this, check it out, underline this, circle it, highlight it. It says, Stand firm, hold your position, and I would say, Take up your position, it says, and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf, O Judah and Jerusalem. Stand firm. Take your position, and you will see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf. And so again, my, my title from last week, my message today too, is take your position, guys. God has made us for this time, for this day and age, for all the craziness that's going on in the world. God has gifted you and me and provided a, us, us the privilege to represent Him, as Scripture says, as ambassadors of Christ to the world. We're His representative. And so, but here's the thing. He says... Stand firm, hold your position, and you will see the salvation of the Lord. But here's the thing is, if you don't take your position in Christ, you will not see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf. And that, that's fearful. That's something to be afraid of, in my opinion. It's like if you don't take your position, see, see, Jesus is holding out a position for you. But maybe you haven't taken it up yet, right? You're like, I don't know if I want to be a Christian yet or if I want to join the church and stuff. So you're holding out, but all the while, Jesus is like, I got this place for you. I made you for a, a plan, for a purpose. Scripture says, let's see, uh, Ephesians 2.10, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. And check this out, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. See, before you and I were even born, God made us for specific plans and purposes. So he made us for 2021. All right, the battle's here. He made us. And now he's like, hey, all you need to do now, you got to show up. Take your position. It's here. I made you for this. It's, it, but the thing is, so many people are like, I don't want that. No, nah, I don't want to live for God. No, too many rules and regulations. No, it's too much uh, religion and too many hypocrites and that type of stuff going on. I don't want anything to do with it. Right? But if you don't take up your position, just being honest with you is you're not going to see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf. If you don't take your position in Jesus Christ, you will not have eternal life. Simple as that. He's like, hey, take up your position and you're going to win. Don't take up your position. You're going to lose. He goes on and he says, Hold your position. See the salvation of the Lord on your behalf, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid and do not be dismayed. Tomorrow, go out against them and the Lord will be with you. Verse uh, 18. Then Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground. He humbled himself. He's praying again, right? It says, And all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell down before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. So this the king bows down. He humbles himself. He's worshiping the Lord. The people fall down and they humble themselves. They're worshiping the Lord. It says, And then verse 19, And the Levites and the Kohathites and the Korahites stood up to praise the Lord, the God of Israel, with a loud, a very loud voice. Sorry to get loud with you, but man, they're praising God. In the midst of a battle, in the midst of uncertainty, in the midst of I don't know what's going to happen next, they're like, let's humble ourselves. Let's worship the Lord. We don't know what's going to happen. We could die tomorrow, but we're going to worship the Lord today. And so they're worshiping the Lord. And another question to ask yourself, man, in the midst of all this drama and craziness and all this, are you worshiping the Lord? 
We've got to have a position of prayer, number one, but we need to have a position of praise, number two. So take your position, a position of prayer, and then number two, a position of praise. We're going to praise God. What does that song say? We're going to praise him on the mountains, and then we're going to praise him in the valleys. All the same. It doesn't matter. He's God today, yesterday, forever. He's good. So we're going to praise him no matter what happens. We're going to praise him before the battle. We're going to praise him in the battle. We're going to praise him after the battle. We're going to see it here. But but the the what I want to get at is like we got to be doing this in the midst of this cert- uncertainty. Man, we've got to have a position of prayer and a position of praise. Don't forget it. Don't let the world steer you astray from that. Verse 20 says, And they rose early in the morning and went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. And when they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you will be established. Believe his prophets, and you will succeed. So he goes out and he basically tells of uh, what was told to him, right? And he's like, believe in the Lord your God and you will be established. I mean, that's the word for me and you today too. Believe in the Lord your God and and we will be established. Was it Psalm chapter 1 where it says, let's just look it up because I'm probably going to misquote it. But you guys know it. Psalm chapter 1. Type it in the chat if you know a little bit of Psalm chapter 1. And where I'm trying to go with this. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. And he says this, He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. See, when we put our trust in the Lord, when we put our trust in Jesus, it's like, All that we do will prosper. It might not seem like we're prospering, right? We might want to grow more than what we are growing, but man, we got to understand, like if we're trusting in the Lord, following the Lord, we're obedient to the Lord. It's like God's going to do what he wants to do. And we'll be established in the Lord. And man, that's enough for me. I just want to be established in the Lord. I want to have salvation in the Lord. And I want to hopefully see other people come to him. But if I don't do any great thing to go down in history, I just want to make sure I'm I'm established in the Lord. He goes on, verse 21, says, And when he had taken counsel with the people, he appointed those who were to sing to the Lord and praise him in the holy attire as they went before the army. I talked about this a little bit last week, but isn't this interesting? They're about to go to war, right? There's three other armies who have joined together to come try to destroy Judah. And they're going to war. And so he says that we appointed these people to sing to the Lord and praise him as they went before the army. So the worship team goes out first. Hey, we're going to what battle? We're going to war. They're like, oh, hey, we're, we're going to put the front line out there. Right? And we think like front line going to be a bunch of guys with guns and different things like ready to battle. But man, no, for here in scripture, like the front line is the drum line. The front line is the drum line, man. Like, they're out there praising the Lord. And how amazing is that? It's like, we're going to praise God before the battle begins because he's good. And check out what they say. It says, give thanks to the Lord for his steadfast love endures forever. Like, the critic of this day, if they said that as we're going to battle, give thanks to the Lord for his steadfast love endures forever. They'd probably be like, but you don't know what's going to happen. If you don't know what's going to have you can't say that you don't know if we're going to live or die but these people they're just like we're going to go all in the god give thanks to the lord and it says his steadfast love endures forever so they're leading with praise again taking your position it involves taking a position of prayer and taking a position of praise despite what's going on around you despite not knowing how things are going to go we're going to praise pray to the lord and we're going to praise the lord Verse 22, it says, And when they began to sing and praise, the Lord set an ambush against the men of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, so that they were routed. For the men of Ammon and Moab rose against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, devoting them to destruction. And when they, <clears throat> when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, they all helped to destroy one another. So what happens here? They went out with praise. We're going to praise the Lord no matter what happens. 
right? Give thanks to the Lord for his steadfast love endures forever. We're going out. They're singing, singing that praise. And then the Lord causes some type of confusion. Remember, there's three armies who team together to come against Judah. And all of a sudden, those three armies turn on one another. Maybe something bad happened there. And they all start to kill one another. And then they kill them all. And it says they destroy one another. And then verse 24, it says, When Judah came to the watchtower of the wilderness, they looked toward the horde, and behold, there were dead bodies lying on the ground. None had escaped. Man, when we position ourselves in, with prayer, when we position ourselves with praise, we're going to see the Lord fight for us. We're going to see victory. And it might not look like this, and hopefully it doesn't. I don't want to see a bunch of dead bodies on the ground, right? But we want to see God bring victory in our lives over sin, over relationships that have been broken with friends and different things. We want to see God have victory in the battles in our country, the strongholds in our country. And so hopefully when we take that position of prayer, position of praise, we see God fight our battles. But again, you won't see God fight your battles if you don't show up to the fight. If you don't take your position, if you will jump down to verse 29, it says, And the fear of God came on all the kingdoms of the countries when they had heard that the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel. So the other countries are starting to hear what God did, how he killed everybody, and Judah uh, was victorious. And so it says, The fear of God came upon them all. And I think that's something to note. Something that's important. In Philippians chapter 1, it says, Let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. And then he says, With standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. And he says that this is a clear... Um, let me look that one up too. Philippians, you guys know it. If you know a little bit of Philippians chapter 1, um, let me know. So standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. See, when we stand and take our position in Christ and we, we're confident, we're going to pray, we're going to praise despite what happens before the battle even begins, right? We're going to take that position it's like, then we see God fight for us. And then once we see God fight for us, other people see God fight for us. And then all of a sudden fear comes upon those people, right? As Flip, uh, Paul says in Philippians chapter one, it's like, it's a clear sign to the world of their destruction, that God is real, that he's not messing around, right? But then it's a clear sign to the world and to us of our salvation that we have been set apart. So it says, verse 30, so the realm of Jehoshaphat was quiet, for his God gave him rest all around. <clears throat> verse, let's, uh, we're going to jump to verse 35, and this is like, this is the end of Jehoshaphat's life. And so we see a lot of success in this story. We see God come through in a mighty way, in a powerful way, when Jehoshaphat and the people are focused, when they are taking their position in their position of prayer, position of praise, right? And they are, they're, they've shown up, All right? But then check it out, verse 35, we see here, Jehoshaphat takes a, a wrong turn, if you will. Verse 35 says, after this, Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, joined with uh, Ahaziah, king of Israel, who acted wickedly. He joined him in building ships to go to Tarshish, and they built the ships in Ezon Geber. The, then Eliezer, the son of Dodavu of Mereshah, prophesied against Jehoshaphat, saying, Because you have joined with Ahaziah, the Lord will destroy what you have made. And the ships were wrecked and were not able to go to Tarshish. Now you're like, ah, whatever. What's the deal with that? Why are we ending there? Well, because this. Jehoshaphat started pretty good. He, he did a lot of good things for God. He took his position. He led other people to take their position with the Lord, to pray, to fast, to praise God in the battle. No matter what happens, good or bad, we're committed. We're, we're all in, right? And then they see God fight for them. But at the end of his life, Jehoshaphat, or towards the end of his life, Jehoshaphat makes a mistake. Instead of taking his position with God, he takes a position with a worldly man. Scripture says, if you read it with me in verse 35, someone who acted wickedly. 
So he was taking his position, making a stand for God, but then something happened. He maybe he compromised a little bit and didn't think it was that big of a deal. And he starts working with a guy in the world. He takes his position elsewhere. And so what we see is he joins this wicked guy in building ships. And again, we might think, ah, not a big deal. It's just a business transaction, trying to make some money, not a big deal. But here's the point. It's like our position is with Jesus Christ alone. Okay, when we try to put our position in Jesus Christ and we try to position ourselves in the world, it's not going to work out. You can't, Jesus says, you cannot serve two masters. You will either love one and hate the other, right? Is what he says. You're going to love one and hate the other. There's going to be division. You can't do both. And so we see Jehoshaphat here near the end of his life. He starts to make this bad decision. It's like he, he lost sight, if you will. And then what happens there at the end of it, he builds these things, these ships. And it says, and then they were all wrecked. They were all wrecked. And then the first verse of chapter 21, if you want to read it with me, it says, Jehoshaphat slept with his fathers. And that means he died with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. And Jehoram, his son, reigned in his place. Now, I just want to ask you and, and bring this up to you, like, how do you want your life to end? If it were to end tonight or tomorrow or in a 20, 30 years, how do you want your life to end? I hope it, you wouldn't want it to end like this, like Jehoshaphat, where he had some successful stories, but then towards the end of his life, he devoted it to building up some worldly things, only to see it all be destroyed. See, if your if your uh, treasure is in the world... Your treasure is going to burn. If, you're, if your focus is on the world, it's not going to satisfy. And so my, my encouragement in this and why I wanted to bring it up again is just to take your position in the midst of all the craziness we see in this, the midst of a divided state of America. I want to encourage you to take your position. Take your position as a child of God. Your position is not as a Republican. Your position is not as a Democrat. Your position is not um, in these different types of things. Your position is as a child of God, a follower of Jesus. Can I get an amen if you agree with me? It's you, That's your position. See, Scripture tells us like you got to be set apart. That you're set apart. Uh, Colossians chapter 3 tells us to set our minds on things that are above, on heavenly things, not on things of the world. Right? See, when we get so wrapped up in politics and things that are going on, we're like, oh, what's going on? We try to figure it out. We try to, this conspiracy theory, that, and whatever. But we're wasting time. I, I didn't jot it down, but um, 1 Timothy, I believe it is. 1 Timothy, um, he talks about, in chapter 2, he talks about prayer, praying for everybody. Right? Pray for those who are in power and government type jobs. Pray for everybody. Pray without ceasing. And then he says that that basically this... i got to look it up again. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2. It says, First of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions. That And here's the thing. That we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. You see that, guys? That, that's part of our position as a Christian, to lead a peaceful and quiet life. If you know anything about Jesus and what he's done in the Gospels, there's never moments other than him flipping over the tables in the temple, but he wasn't harming people. He, he was bringing peace. He was showing people the way to live is the way to love, the way, the way that he wants us to treat other people. And so your position, guys, again, as Christians, is not in the world, is not to take sides and start pointing fingers and casting condemnation. Guys, Jesus said himself, he says, I did not come to condemn the world, but I came that I might save the world. And Jesus has all the right in the world to condemn. He's God. And if Jesus doesn't want to condemn you or I, why would we want to condemn each other? Why would we want to condemn others in the world? See, our, our position is as a child of God and to call other people into his kingdom and to say, hey, Jesus has a position for you too. Yeah, he knows what you've done. He knows what you've been about. 
but he wants to forgive you of those things. He wants to give you eternal life, and it's 2 Timothy chapter 2, and it says this, Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, so maybe you've been, you've been uh, as Jehoshaphat, working with people in the world, uh, you've been unequally yoked with friends, unequally yoked in relationships, unequally yoked in um, co-workers and things that you're doing. Maybe you've been in that state where Jehoshaphat was unequally yoking himself with someone who did not care about God or the things of God. And so here's the thing in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 21. He says, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be made a vessel for honorable use. So you might think that you've blown it, i messed up, I've done too many bad things, and that, let me tell you, that may be true. That's true of me. I used to think that way. But then when I read the scriptures, he's telling us, hey, yeah, that mess that you made, that dishonorable stuff that you did, if you come to me, I can, I can change you, I can clean you, and I can make you into a vessel for honorable use. And he says, he will be a vessel for honor, honorable use, set apart as holy, ready for every good work. See, that's what God wants to do for, for us. He wants, he's calling you. He's calling me. We've, we were made for a time such as this. A message I listened to recently, the, the guy was saying a message. It, I mean, it's much more complicated to explain right now, but his message essentially was no one else is coming. And he's like, no one else is coming. Like, we are the church, and we are here right now. Like, there is no one else. If we're waiting for someone else to bring the solution, someone else is going to come step in and step it up. It's like, no, man, we are the church, and we have the opportunity to serve, go out in the world, and, and take our position, fight this battle. And again, remember the two points there. Fight this battle. Take your position. Uh, position of prayer, position of praise is powerful. And so over this next week, I hope that you would take time to position yourself in prayer, position yourself in praise there, especially as we're praying and fasting. Um, take this serious and come before the Lord. And I just hope that you're somewhat like me, just brokenhearted over the state of our country. I started out this message saying how, man, I just, I hate the state of the country as far as what we're in right now. Super grateful for it. I love America. Grateful to be born here. Uh, raised here, have all the privileges that we have here in America. But man, I'm just so, I'm broken over the state of it. But see, that brokenness shouldn't drive us to fear to where we react in hateful ways. But it should drive us to react in praying and, and fasting, seeing this great, great warfare that's going on. So going back to my question, guys, when I started out, I was like, what, what are you going to do about it? The, it's up to you, really, at the end of the day. Um, you can take your position or leave it, but, um, but God wants to do great things. And so we are the church. He wants to use you. Um, and I hope you believe it. Amen? Amen, if you guys believe that. Let's pray real quick. Father, we thank you for your word. God, it is good. It is living and active, Lord. So exciting to get into, Lord. But I pray, Lord, that you would press your word into our hearts, Lord, that you would write your word on the tablet of our hearts, God, that we would remember it, that we would take it serious, Lord, that we would hunger and thirst for more of it, God, and that you would feed us, that we would grow, Lord, as, as you said when tempted by Satan, that man does not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So, God, give us a hunger for, the, for your word. Lord, help us to to not care so much about the physical, but to invest in the spiritual, in the spiritual health, the spiritual life with you, God. So teach us, guide us, help us to take our position, Lord, this week. Help us to take our position of prayer, being people who pray, being people who also take our position of praise, God. No matter what's going on around us, Lord, you are still good, you are still true, and your love endures forever, God. And so help us to praise you in the battles and in the, in the victories, just all of it. God, and help us to be people of prayer and praise and help us to see people who would see victory in your name as we take our position as your kids, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. And we said, amen. Well, thank you guys for joining in with us here tonight. I know it was a little last minute, a little, um, what do you call it? I don't know, just go with the flow. But uh, I believe that it, 
I don't know. I believe God has a, a position for us. And so I hope that we would take our positions. I hope that we would see God fight for us, bring victories for us. Um, and just remember, our position is not with the world. Our position is with Jesus. And I know that it's tempting to get involved in the world and in the arguments and the uh, debates and things of that age, of this age. I shouldn't say that age. This is happening now. I know it's tempting to get involved in those things. But uh, just remember... We're on team Jesus, and uh, Jesus came to save the world, not condemn the world. So take your positions in Christ Jesus. See what he would do. Uh, thanks, guys, again for watching. If you haven't shared this yet, share it on your Facebook feed for other people to check it out. Uh, and be sure to check out our next messages online. Um, but thanks for watching. Now go out there live a fervent life so that people may know Jesus. Peace out. God bless.